music has been such an important part of my life and just every day ever since I was born. Some of my earliest memories are of vague, dark, gold and like dim, I don't know, sights and then like the sound and the Mozart. Hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to like yeah. Yeah, really pinpoint it but yeah it was definitely like one of my first sensory memories is is hearing Mozart because my parents kept playing this one cassette that they had and then I would recognize it as just kind of like always hearing it Mm -hmm. it was kind of just always there it was the first sounds or something but my dad had a bunch of classical CDs um, and I'd always be fascinated by the covers of them but the first one that I really latched onto and loved was a uh, CD of the Planet Suite by Holst. Yeah. Yeah. It was with Montreal Symphony with Charles Dutois. A lot of times I just like as a kid, I didn't really question a lot of things. I would just kind of open the CD case and look. And there's a photo of like Charles Dutois there. He was just a guy who was there. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't think like, oh, who's that? Did he write the music? He like, just lives he, in the CD. He case. lives. Yeah. yeah guy who lives inside the cd case (laughs) yeah and then my dad had this stereo that like had this orange light you know coming from this display and i remember that very Mm -hmm. distinctly and um we had that cd player for a long time like the tray used to get jammed so we had to take a butter knife sometimes and pry it open but yeah listening to the planets was just fuel for my imagination and the visions i would have and just imagine come up with all these wild uh reveries um, and around that time, like the first movie I ever saw was Fantasia. Mm-hmm. So that was just, wow. you know, yeah, very musically and visually like infused upbringing that cemented, okay, this is the kind of music that I love and the kind of movies that movie I love. So I didn't appreciate stuff like Vivaldi or Telemann, which yeah. my dad had CDs of, of those. Didn't really appreciate those at the time. I wanted the more romantic composers and like the rite of spring was my favorite part of fantasia so you know stuff like that kind of became a mainstay and then it was i remember fantasia when fantasia 2000 came out for a while i wasn't able to see it um and it just had the soundtrack so i was just listening to that and imagining you know whatnot but that movie's like like half a movie yeah it's almost it, embarrassed it, to be what it is i know it's a it's, a it's a shame like it, it's hobbling along and it's, it's just consolation roy disney trying to get it you know yeah. done but it's just like we have to do it this way or not at all it feels right. like yeah it's like we'll we'll make the movie but we want to put in all these irrelevant entertainers to keep people entertained because they're bored during the actual movie and then on top of that you know, we can't go on for too long because people lose the attention span. So it's basically an hour long movie. And then within that hour long movie, we'll also just repeat the most popular segment from the first Fantasia because people will expect that and we'll do it in the wrong aspect ratio or well, we'll just make it window boxed and blow uh, it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that movie was on, they showed Fantasia 2000 in IMAX. Oh, wow. Can you imagine <laughs> the Sorcerer's Apprentice yeah. in that format. With... <laughs> Good grief. But then they, my mom had the uh, LP for Fantasia, which was put out in like, I don't know what if it's the 50s or, or was the 60s, but it was like the three LP set with this beautiful gatefold with this booklet and everything. Yeah. And I'd listen to that because I was really into Fantasia. And then I got into Bach because of Fantasia as well. So, it, it, mm. you know, the movie has done some great yeah. things in many ways, but listening to like classical music, but we actually had a box. We somehow got a box of these compilations of classical composers. There's like 10 discs, I think. And it was mm-hmm. a whole bunch of them. And I would go through them a lot. And I really liked Tchaikovsky. You know, I liked some of Verdi, but I, I liked um, Strauss, Johann Strauss Jr. I liked the waltzes a lot. And- yeah. My earliest memories of music, among them was was actually a lot of classical from my parents got this cassette this box set of cassettes Hmm. they're the lives of the great composers and so they weren't they weren't just music they were actually musical biographies so it would trace through the whole life of a composer and throughout that cassette you would get a mini biography read but then there would be it would be overtaken by the music. So as you're getting an overview of the life of the composer, you're also being exposed to the music of the period in like their childhood phase. And then it would move on up through their own music and their their development of their musical styles and stuff like that. And so I was mm-hmm. exposed to Beethoven, Chopin, Vivaldi, Corelli, uh, Grieg, who I loved as a child, 
uh, Edvard Grieg was my favorite classical composer. Um, well, I guess romantic composer, but you know what I mean mm-hmm. uh, of, of that yeah, type of music. You know, yeah, I listened to that cassette just a ton, and uh, you know his his piano concertos were just my favorite music of all, as well as just his Pierre Gint, of course. You know, sort of default mode classical music, I guess. But Strauss as well was really really big for me. You know, the just all the Vienna waltzes and. Oh yeah, and that stuff. Just I, I really loved that, and Tchaikovsky. I was really big into. It's funny. It was impossible for me because these were not just musical presentations, but also biographies. It was impossible for me to divorce the music from the life of the composer. And so, hmm. uh, for example, I didn't like listening to sh- the Schumann cassette because his life was, you know, just rife with depression and mental illness and. <laughs> I mean, most of these guys died early. So like that was always a sort of hanging specter over most Wait of Wait till you get to the Wagner one. Yikes. Well, there actually wasn't a Wagner cassette in that box set for whatever reason. I guess because it was orchestral. There was some vocal stuff in there, but I don't know mm-hmm. if it, because it, like a lot of his major work was operatic, maybe he wasn't included for that reason. But uh, yeah, so like, for example, Schumann, I didn't really like listening to it. I mean, also because it was mainly piano, but mm-hmm. because when I listened to it and even the music would just sort of conjure up these images of just this Hmm. this really dark and depressing life and so those things kind of adhered i think that was also why i liked grieg so much is because he you know out of all the composers in that box that he lived the longest he lived into the 20th century and by all accounts had this very sort of you know happy and prosperous life and so the music there was this golden tinge to it because of that felt like i could fully embrace it this music is is a happy place and you know Hmm. but even then that didn't put me off some of the darker lives like Tchaikovsky and mm-hmm. and things like that. I really love the Tchaikovsky cassette and uh, Vivaldi. Actually, I really gravitated towards as well. Yeah, so I was exposed to a lot of classical, and it was something that I kept returning to again and again. Uh, and again, not just getting acquainted with specific pieces. Although I could, you would open up the cassettes and they would have a list of each piece and when it appeared. So you could, I could Mm. figure out like, okay, this piece is what's playing here, but also the composers and their whole body of work. It was something that I kind of was able to intuitively grasp as a child. Then I was also like, yeah, really getting into more classical music. A lot of times films were getting me to look into it because I hear something in a film. And so, yeah, on YouTube, I was discovering AMVs and there was, there's this one AMV, which was a... Royal Space Force Wings of Onyami's AMV that was using Tchaikovsky's Symphony Number no. Six, um, the third movement, and uh, you know I had never really listened to Tchaikovsky's symphonies before. It's a great AMV, but it's it was the first video I favorited, and then it got privated by the uploader. <laughs> So I just like, I've never been able to see it since, but it was like really well done and the music was fantastic. So I was like, oh, I got to look up the symphony. And then that's when I realized it's like, okay, to get a specific performance, Hmm. you know, there's the conductor, there's the orchestra, you got to consider all these things. And so that's when I started searching around for the perfect sixth, the pathetique. And I remember like we had the library listening to some. And at the time I was like, it was a Russian. I remember in the description of Russian conductor, like with a Russian orchestra. And I, I just couldn't remember the name, but again, with like an M. So for a little while, I was, I was like at a loss. Like that's when I discovered Herbert von Karajan his Tchaikovsky symphonies from this two CD set. And then I had the pathetique. I was like, well, that one's not as good as the the one, but the mm-hmm. rest of it I haven't compared to. So that's good. And, and then there was like a CD. It was like a cheapo CD at Barnes and Noble. It was like the Seraphim label. It was Tchaikovsky's sixth paired with Scriabin's poem of ecstasy. And wow. Yeah, I that. didn't even, I barely, <laughs> like I ignored poem of ecstasy for a while because it was I just got it for the pathetic and I listened to that and I was like oh I'll listen to this one and, uh, and I kind of didn't really like get through the whole thing I'm like this is 20 minutes long and then like one year at uh the Mount Laurel Library I found like oh there's a set of Tchaikovsky symphonies with this guy uh, Eugene Mravinsky with the you know some Russian I was like oh the Russian name with the Russian orchestra maybe this is it and yeah it turned out to be I mean I recognized it immediately it just had the right power and oomph to it um mm-hmm. the third movement of the sixth just there's, there's no better one like it can't compare but there was that. But then, yeah, so I discovered Wagner through watching Unshian Andalou. Yeah, so the, the film by Salvador Dali and Luis Bunuel, a uh, surrealist film. We actually watched that in uh, my art class. You know, it was a very progressive school. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. We would watch things and like, 
and the teacher would just ask us like no does anyone have nobody has a problem with this right or like some some certain questionable things mm -hmm. nobody was gonna say yeah i gotta no but yeah so there's unshi and andalu i'm watching this film and it's just like you know mesmerizing it's an amazing film and then there's this music in there that is just utterly hypnotic and beautiful and it was the instrumental version of the Liebes Toad from Tristan and Isolde so I was like you know in the credits I was like oh okay Richard Wagner music okay and then I remember the name Tristan and Isolde okay and next time I was at Barnes Noble I bought it like a two for CD of Wagner overtures and then it had the Liebes Toad in it uh, the orchestral version yeah so that's how I got into Wagner and yeah, so I just one one night I was like listening to uh, the poem of ecstasy because I was like I have oh yeah there's this other thing and that was like <laughs> that was really like hitting gradually that the piece builds and builds to this prismatic kaleidoscopic um, orgasmic conclusion. There's yeah. no other word for it. And so like I listened to that, I was like, wow, that was great. But like, it wasn't until a few years later when I was doing like had ideas for like vol and stuff, and I just had something more thematic while listening to it that it just cemented in my head I was like this is super powerful this is incredible and I, I'm like that became yeah one of my favorite pieces ever and like we'd have tunes so yeah the store tunes they opened up and there's like a used music and movie store basically you know really cheap cds so we would just get them on the cheap and there was some classical record yeah a bunch of classical that I got from there so like some Vivaldi and usually it was just I saw a video on YouTube or a movie and it had this piece and I was like I gotta find this piece mm -hmm. and then later that expanded into okay I want to see more of this composer and eventually I became like okay at first you know I was a real basic biatch in <laughs> classical you know oh Carrie-Anne yeah. I, I was calling him Carajan. yeah mm -hmm. boy howdy was I a rube but <laughs> <laughs> it was it was super uh, now it's just really cringy, but it's, it was kind of funny at the time. I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, carry in. It's really funny too. When I found out like the whole carry in gold series, they like did those after he died apparently because he had the mixing all just blown out portion when he was recording those later ones. And like they called those carry on gold, but they were just fixing some of those recordings. I, there's a lot of great carry in. Um, but then I started like discovering some other conductors or orchestras and, you know, you had to start somewhere. You had to get yeah. your knowledge in terms of like collecting music. That's when I really got into stuff. Cause going into college, I was going to record stores and I was going to FYE in Philly. That was when it all really started. And I was buying like classical music cause they had a lot of used stuff and it was always really cheap and you could just find some really good recordings. I had to save up for like really good stuff. Like the first opera that i bought was parsifal which was the absolute worth every penny that that one but actually like this past christmas megan got me the ring cycle so they got me the box set of the salty ring and i listened to that on my commute but to and from work over the course of a month just finished that which was pretty extraordinary if you just read the summary of like each act and you just kind of pay attention to the themes the leitmotifs and they come in it's at least good enough for, until i can actually sit down and read the libretto but it was still a very emotional experience, but like musically wise since then it's, it's kind of been like YouTube has also been a huge area of like discovery. Cause like while I'm has, working yeah. on art and whatnot, I will discover stuff on YouTube by listening to classical channels. Like there's these channels called like Wellish. I don't even know how to pronounce it, but it was these multiple channels that just upload classical pieces or like modern pieces like all kinds of composers, but they always pick really suitable artwork to go mm -hmm. with each each piece. And that's been really inspiring and influential. And, you know, out of the strangest place you would think to get inspiration, just this YouTube channel. But I've discovered a lot of composers. I really like like Weinberg and Ginastera. A lot of times I'd just be listening to something and uh, then I discovered, oh, Manuel Rosenthal, uh, Le Petit Metier. You know, just this beautifully charming suite of uh, pieces. And then you have this photograph of all these little puppets. And then I just get an idea for like a character or scenario or something. So that channel is responsible for a lot of good ideas over the years. One thing I should mention, um, but I haven't been to a lot of concerts, only a handful, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to go to the Philadelphia Orchestra. Mm hmm a few times which was which was great it was one time i bought two tickets to a performance of alexander nevsky prokofiev's score with live accompaniment to the film wow 
That's extraordinary. Yeah, amazing. You had this orchestra with the organ and everything, and then you had the film propelling you along, and the audience was great, really into it. It was like a silent film, kind of, in that respect. Little moments like where the Russians, like they overrun the the Germans, the Teutonic camp, and there's like this like organ player for their... Uh, ceremony and like they knock over the organ in the film and then the guy on the actual like organ in the concert hall he just kind of like does this little like just like <laughs> like <little laughs> organ. Was, wow got a great laugh from the audience so it was a it was a really great experience and then it might have been the only yeah the other time i went was with you yeah because we went to see them performing the poem of ecstasy you're dang right. And it was everything I'd hoped it would be. It was it was magnificent. And there's kind of this like joke, running joke with Stankus and me. We're, we're listening to uh, the poem of ecstasy and there's a recording he has, which is like a live recording. And at the end of it, like after this huge climax um, and it ends and you just hear somebody in the audience just go like, oh, <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> we we'll just laugh at that. But at this concert that we were at, the orchestra sustained the longest final note of like that and that piece I've ever heard. And it was just, it was exquisite. And at, I couldn't even, I couldn't even suppress it. I couldn't help it. But after it ended, I just let out this like, whoa, <laughs> you were that guy. I was that guy. Yeah. And I hope there's a recording of that performance out there.